I want to introduce our first keynote uh, speaker. And I've actually known and followed Paul's career since uh, around 2009, 2010, when uh, he started the Adaptive Vehicle Make program at uh, DARPA. Uh, Paul's got degrees from MIT, Caltech. He also has a JD degree from Georgetown University. He's had really, I would look at these as a set of dream jobs. Yeah, a DARPA program manager, looking at how do we really accelerate the development, design, verification, and manufacturing of uh, complex systems. Having a significant role leading the development of a new cell, new cell phone technology at, uh, at uh, Google, chief technology officer at Airbus. I actually, I was envious of that since I had uh, been at Boeing for many, many years and thought, wow, this is really cool stuff. And, and last, the uh, chief technology officer at United Technology. The most attractive thing here and really why we thought, wow, this is a story that really we should hear is, is Paul's vision. It's really, how do you move industry to really accelerate the design, verification, and manufacture of very complex, large-scale cyber physical systems, things like airplanes, things like uh, large unmanned air vehicles, automobile, complex automotive systems. And you know, these are truly the challenge problems that when we think about moving the needle with cyber physical system research, this is really where it happens and where the rubber meets the road, creating that vision, and not only that, being able to oversee how do we get people moving in that direction and start really accelerating this process. So without further ado, what I'd like to do is introduce Paul. He's going to uh, talk about how he did this, his journey, and uh, I really am excited to hear this. Thank you. All right. Well, good morning. Um, thank you very much, uh, David, for that uh, for that very kind introduction. Uh, I want to talk to you today, uh, as David said, about the design of large scale, mostly highly integrated cyber physical systems. And of course, I imagine that of greatest interest to this audience is probably a perspective on the future. But I found in my career that it also pays to be a student of history in order to really understand the present and to be able to frame the future in a proper context. So I'd like to first beg your indulgence and uh, take you through a brief history of engineering design. Although design has been around for uh, quite a long time, there have only been a few distinct design epochs uh, throughout history. And today I'll talk about three. And the shift between them, you might expect to be driven by the desire for additional capability, but it's actually almost always driven by cost and schedule considerations. And it's pretty rare that you truly can't build a system with existing design methods. It's usually a situation where you can't build the next thing because the last one cost so much and took so long. And so, for instance, could the Apollo program have gotten us to the moon without modern systems engineering? Perhaps. But it wouldn't have taken eight years and an average cost of only about a half percent of GDP. It's also no coincidence that the advancement in design methods has almost always been driven by either military or transportation applications, and frequently by military transportation applications. They've been at the leading edge of what we as a civilization are capable of creating and capable of affording. The notable exception to this, by the way, is VLSI design for integrated circuits, and I am going to talk uh, quite a bit about that later, uh, later in the talk. So let's begin at the beginning. Probably the first real example of an engineering design was the bow and the arrow. There it is. 
which emerged in sub-Saharan Africa during the Middle Stone Age. So that's about 60, 60,000 years ago. Now, why was it significant? It's not, it was the first, it was not actually the first composite tool, which means a tool that's manufactured from, uh, from multiple components. The Neanderthals actually made axes from wooden clamshafts and a stone blade, and that was some 300,000 years ago. The bow and arrow, however, is the first time that we see one composite device employed to effectively utilize another composite device. And the cognitive complexity of this combination is thought to be a capability that is unique to Homo sapiens. It's also the first example of modularity in engineering design. Now, granted, this is a very loosely coupled modular system, but it is coupled, and it's coupled with a couple of design parameters, the length and the weight of the arrow, uh, the string tension in the bow. It's also the first example of a fairly complex manufacturing process, including water, fire, and adhesive, and a lubricant. And the lubricant was used to prevent uh, cracking of the bowstring. And it, it, there was also a variety of subsidiary tools that were necessary to carry this out. So things for carrying water, for stirring, for cutting, etc. And each of those things too had a manufacturing process to go along with it. So this was a remarkable breakthrough 60,000 years ago. But to me, what is even more remarkable is that this was pretty much the state of the art for the next 58 and a half thousand years. Progress in weapons technology very quickly became synonymous with advances in metallurgy once we got out of the Stone Age. And so shipbuilding actually became the industry which was pushing the limits of engineering design. And until the 1500s, shipbuilding was done very much in the same craft tradition of design as the bow and the arrow in the Stone Age. Um, the, uh, the, the historian David McGee from, from MIT describes this craft tradition of, of engineering design in, in the following words, which, which I could not write better than, than he did. Um, in the absence of drawings, the defining characteristic of the craft approach is that craftsmen work immediately with their materials. The final dimensions are determined only as the materials are actually worked and the artifact is actually made. There is no separation of design from making. The two activities take place at the same time. And there is no separation of designer from maker. They are the same person. Craftsmen compensate for errors, inaccuracies, and inconsistencies in the material as they work. They change their mind as they go along. They consider what has been done and respond to it, maintaining a feedback loop with the object in a process that is traditionally referred to as cutting and fitting. Now, the craft tradition of engineering suffered from three kinds of limitations. First, it was quite inefficient. It resulted in significant waste of materials as each part would start out being oversized and then be cut down to shape. This cutting and fitting process was also extremely laborious. And because each fitting decision was an exercise in engineering judgment, it required labor that was quite skilled and therefore quite expensive. And in fact, the system of apprenticeship arose to provide a trained workforce of craftsmen. And since a lot of engineering judgment went into the cutting and fitting process, the overall time and cost to complete a product of any complexity was highly, highly variable. And so was the outcome. The product itself was highly variable. Now, the second, the second shortcoming was that the craft system really disincentivized innovation. Uh, because there was no way to predict whether a particular change would work and would actually improve the product, there was a natural reluctance to deviate from the last known working design. And apprentices were selected not for their creativity, but for their ability to faithfully emulate their master. And so innovation crept pretty slowly for many millennia. And the third big limitation of the craft approach was that it limited the complexity of the overall product that could be built. Because each part was uniquely cut and fitted, there was no systematic approach for splitting the work among multiple craftsmen or multiple shifts of workers. If you did have a team working on a product, they had to be very, very closely supervised by the master craftsman who took charge of ensuring that all the parts would fit together and work together. This limited the practical size of the team, and more importantly, limited the complexity of the design to the cognitive capacity of the master craftsman. Now, as you, we get closer to the Renaissance era, we saw the invention of linear perspective, which enabled the first engineering sketches, like uh, the one you see there uh, by Leonardo da Vinci. 
And these might have stirred the imagination, and I actually think they still stir the imagination, but they didn't seem to have had a practical impact on engineering and engineering design. And it wasn't until the 17th century that we saw the craft era finally draw to a close and give way to something radical, the use of dimension drawings in engineering design. At this point, a few things were happening in Europe. First, Britain was on the rise as a great naval power. The cost of the Navy was becoming a significant draw on the Royal Treasury. There was pressure to find more cost-effective ways to design and build ships. And also, the scientific revolution was now well underway. And the best scientific minds of the time, people like Boyle, Hooke, Wren, Bernoulli, and even Newton, were very much focused on the shipbuilding problem. And today we think of, for instance, Newton's Principia as, uh, there it is, as famous for the laws of classical mechanics. But at the time, it made a much bigger splash, so to speak, um, for what turned out to be an incorrect solution to the problem of finding the shape of minimal resistance in a fluid. And there's the shape. As the cost of the Navy continued to grow, King Charles I made a fateful decision. He brought back a medieval tax custom called ship money to raise taxes to support the Navy beyond what the English Parliament had approved. And although his action was endorsed by the courts, it proved so unpopular that it became one of the major issues that incited the English Revolution, the rise of Oliver Cromwell, and Charles's ultimate beheading. So there's a memorable picture for you there. After the restoration of the monarchy, Charles's son, Charles II, took a different approach, which seems smart. And instead, he made a number of reforms to professionalize the Royal Navy. And one of them was the introduction of dimension drawings. And this, this really was huge. It enabled the standardization of the design. It enabled the decomposition of the design for production and the separation of design from production. So the naval architect was now based in London, and the dock worker was no longer a master craftsman. He could be paid much less. Many of them could work on the problem at once, and they could work in shifts. The worker's only task, then, was to make shapes that were determined and specified by the designer. And any creative contribution by the worker was a mistake, because if a part was altered by one worker, it would no longer fit with parts that were properly made by, by other laborers. And there was a recognition at the time that the ship's behavior was highly sensitive to its geometry. But apart from some general rules of thumbs and heuristics that arose over, over the centuries, this relationship between geometry and the ship's performance was pretty much an enigma. And Samuel Pepys, who, who was the, the head of the Admiralty under Charles II, he observed, quote, that it is worthy of note how small things are sometimes found to mar or mend a ship's quality. And the introduction of measured drawings and this intense scientific focus on, on the problem meant that there was a flurry of activity to try and predict the behavior of a ship's design before actually building it. And the 17th and 18th centuries both yielded quite a number of, of scientific theories and models. And some, like Newton's solid of minimal resistance, were just flat out wrong. But there are many others that were right. And they today form the foundation of, of modern fluid mechanics. But the path from scientific theory to engineering practice is really not a straightforward one. So while engineers of the time recognized that the problem of design is all about trade-offs and compromises between competing objectives, the scientists had a very different view. They were looking for perfection. And so it was Pepys, again, who reported that Robert Boyle, the guy who is known for Boyle's Law, among other things, tried to develop, quote, a way to prove the true body of a ship. And Christopher Wren, who was the guy that, uh, that architected St. Paul's Cathedral, uh, he tried to create, quote, the truest figure for any body to pass through water. And for all that effort, by the end of the 18th century, the only predictive models that were actually useful in shipbuilding were of a ship's displacement and of a ship's stability. And both calculations began with a really laborious accounting of the distribution of mass in a ship. It could take up to two years to calculate the location of the center of gravity and the center of buoyancy for a ship, which is longer than it actually took to build the ship. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century with the invention of a mechanical integrator that the stability calculation in naval architecture became one that was actually practical to do. Now, 
as we move into the 20th century, by the, by the beginning of this century, uh, last century, uh, aeronautical design was starting to displace naval design as the great technological problem of the time. But the design approach to airplanes picked up pretty much where naval architecture had left off. There were dimension drawings. Uh, predictive behavioral models of the airplane weren't that much better uh, than the ones of the ship. Uh, and, and were really paced by the ability to move scientific theory and put it in practical engineering applications. And so instead, empirical models were starting to fill that void and fill that need with really rapid explosive growth in wind tunnel testing. And some of this wind tunnel testing is, is incredible as you look at it. It covered vast numbers of possible design variations. World War II and the years that immediately followed it, we're getting to the modern epoch, I promise. Um, World War II and the years that immediately followed it saw an avalanche of technological progress. And uh, most notably was probably the invention of the atom bomb and that of the digital electronic computer. And the atom bomb was significant because the Manhattan Project, perhaps like nothing else in the history of, of mankind, built the link and cemented the link between science and engineering. Because in the course of just a few short years, the nuclear fission reaction went from a theoretical concept to a practical weapon that ended the war. So there was now a model for transitioning scientific concepts to practical applications. The digital electronic computer, of course, is why we are here today, talking about cyber physical systems. And it presented for the first time a discrete mathematical abstraction over an analog electrical device. At the time, it was a vacuum tube. And that was the first meaningful use of abstraction to hide complexity in an engineering system. It didn't take long after the first computer to recognize that a new approach to engineering design was going to be needed. And one of the precipitating events for that was the US Air Force's SAGE Air Defense Program, which took the better part of the decade of the 1950s. And the purpose of SAGE, which, which stands for Semi-Automatic Ground Environment, was to gather and process data from ground radar sites to produce targeting inter information in real time for intercepting aircraft and interceptor missiles. And the SAGE program was both a spectacular success and a resounding failure. It resulted in many innovations in computer hardware and networking and software development methods. And I do think that it is firmly enshrined in the annals of computing history. Uh, it was a massive step change in system complexity over anything that we had seen before. And it was the first time that we saw significant software complexity as part of a system. Uh, but as a result, or in part at least as a result, the program took too long, it was too expensive, and by the time it was fielded in 1959, the long-range bomber threat against which SAGE was designed was largely superseded by ICBMs. And so at completion, it was the single most expensive program in history. It cost over $10 billion in then-year dollars. And just to put that in perspective, that was five times the cost of the Manhattan Project. So Sage's contribution to the history of engineering design was really to highlight the urgency and the urgent need for a new design methodology. And the Air Force rushed in and did just that with the Atlas ICBM program. And the Atlas was starting just as Sage was hitting a lot of its issues around 1954. The Atlas program was headed by General Bernie Schriever, who is uh, quite an iconic figure in Air Force history. And uh, Schriever had the charter that the program be, and this is a quote from, from the Secretary of the Air Force, accelerated to the maximum extent the technological development will permit. How's that for a, for a program charter? Uh, and that was, of course, in light of the perceived missile gap <clears throat> with the Soviet Union. And Schriever really made the best of this mandate. Uh, and he went on to create what, uh, the, the, what we today call modern systems engineering. And by 1957, the Atlas program harnessed the efforts of 17 prime contractors, 200 subcontractors, and a workforce of 70,000 people. So for a single pro product development, that was absolutely, absolutely unprecedented. And so systems engineering, modern systems engineering, is a methodical approach for decomposing a large design problem across teams of design engineers, and then subsequently integrating those pieces back into a whole system. And the systems engineering workflow, I suspect most of you know this, but I'll, I'll say it anyway, uh, it goes something like this. So you partition the system, and you typically partition the system along functional expertise lines. Then you decompose and flow down the requirements of the system. 
and you allocate them to each one of these partitions. You specify the interfaces between the different partitions. Then you design and optimize within each partition to meet, in, a, in some kind of optimal way, the, uh, the requirements that were allocated to it. You integrate all of the individual designs together. And as you do that, you do verification testing to confirm that the system does, in fact, meet its requirements. And then finally, you go and you validate the entire system to make sure that it can actually accomplish its mission and that your requirements were the correct requirements in the first place. So what I just described for you is what most of us envision or visualize as the, the systems engineering V model. And this was the first time that the complexity of a design was not limited by the cognitive capacity of a single engineer. It was a way of bringing together teams of experts in aerodynamics and structures, propulsion, guidance, and control, and have them all effectively contribute towards the design of the whole system. And notably, by the way, controls, right? I said controls. That was the cybernetic portion of the missile. And systems engineering brought a welcome structure after the SAGE experience to the nascent field of software development. Now, the SAGE operational program, <clears throat> to animate what you, see, what you see on that screen, had about 100,000 lines of uh, machine language instructions. And straight away, two opportunities for improving programming productivity became apparent. The first was modularity for purposes of reusing segments of code that you already wrote. So once you wrote the code, like to compute, I don't know, the sine or cosine of an angle, uh, I think the advantage of reusing that code segment every time you need to go do trigonometry is fairly obvious. And modularity also had the immediate benefit of allowing parallel development by multiple programmers uh, on a piece of software. The, the, second, uh, the second immediate opportunity for improvement was abstraction. And so the, the first low-hanging fruit was basically to take machine, uh, machine code uh, and, and, be able, and enable writing it in some kind of human-friendly human -friendly form, uh, which was assembly language. Um, but very shortly after that came the first high-level programming language, uh, which was Fortran, that would actually present the programmer with a mathematical abstraction that was independent of, of the underlying machine. And by the end of the 50s, there was a half dozen such, uh, such high-level languages. And since then, there have been at least two additional levels of abstraction uh, that have found their way in, into software design. And these enable uh, today, in, in many cases, the programmer to express really high-level functional requirements or, or even design intent. And uh, from that, the software and the code uh, for, uh, that is machine-specific can be automatically generated. Uh, and software presented a third major opportunity for, for productivity enhancement, but that one went largely ignored for a number of decades. And I blame, in, in significant part, the subjugation of the software development process to the broader cyber-physical uh, system, system engineering methodology. And, uh, and this is because so design closure for a physical system is not a trivial task, right? It requires combining the results of behavioral models of all of the, of all of the different domains, of all of the different partitions in the system, uh, to try and be, be able to predict the overall performance of the system against, against the requirements. And this happens, uh, it can only afford to happen a handful of times throughout the, the design process. And typically, it supports the, the major milestone review decisions, you know, PDR, CDR, things like that. And so software development ended up following this same model until the 1990s. And, and it semi-pejoratively became known as the waterfall model, uh, with only a handful of major builds uh, throughout the software design cycle. But design closure for software, of course, is much more straightforward than, than for a physical system. Uh, the behavioral model is, is the software itself, and the functional performance is just a matter of compiling and, and running the software. And so today, of course, the standard practice is agile development with, with daily, weekly, or, or maybe biweekly uh, software builds, and incorporating the learnings and the changes from, from one build into the next, and incrementally building the functionality uh, to ultimately meet the system requirement. And the systems engineering methodology uh, remains to this day the, the dominant design model for large-scale complex uh, cyber-physical systems in aerospace and defense, and also actually in most commercial sectors. Uh, in my career, I, I practiced it uh, on the aerospace side at DARPA, at, Air, at, at Airbus, uh, Collins, and Pratt and & Whitney, uh, which are both parts, parts of UTC. Um, but I also saw it practiced at, uh, at Motorola, at Carrier, Otis Elevators, also, also parts of UTC. Um, and it's pretty much, pretty much the same everywhere. 
Uh, and software teams that are part of, of the systems engineering process for, for a bigger product, they typically use agile development, and then they have to freeze and kind of like fake the inputs to the major waterfall, uh, waterfall design decisions, design milestones uh, that, happen, uh, that happen in the broader product. But before I go on to, to critique modern systems engineering, uh, which, which I will I, I rest assured I will do, let me say that it, it has been the most successful design methodology in history. It solved all of the historical shortcomings of the epochs that came before it. Uh, it enabled the efficient deployment of labor by separating design from manufacturing, and further, by partitioning the design problem along these, these functional discipline lines. And this actually allowed, so clearly it allowed a lower cost workforce on, on the manufacturing side, but it also allowed engineers to specialize, which economists tell us is a good thing. And, and, and it enabled lower cost, uh, much more junior engineers to perform a lot of the, of the low level tasks, which could be codified more or less as standard work uh, in each of the engineering disciplines. Um, and it also facilitated innovation in a way that the previous two design epochs did not, because systems are now designed to requirements and not just as incremental departures from, uh, from a previous design. And so we all like, I know, to complain about the slow pace of innovation in aerospace and defense. And, and certainly large organizations exhibit risk aversion and, and groupthink and, and other sort of bureaucratic maladies. Uh, but here, I, I think it's very important to separate organizational will from the design methodology. And systems engineering is not the thing to blame. Uh, in fact, I think we should thank it for many incredible innovations that range from Apollo to, to GPS to the modern and incredibly safe uh, and efficient commercial air transportation system. And it made possible the creation of products of complexity that would have been just completely unimaginable uh, in, in previous eras. But, but the complexity does come at a cost, uh, both figuratively and, and literally. And uh, there are many ways of showing the, the cost and complexity progression in aerospace and defense systems. Uh, and I think the fact that both are growing, growing uh, quite rapidly is, is a relatively uncontroversial point, I hope, uh, with this audience. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid complexity metrics because they get a little wonky, especially when you get into the, into the physical side of the systems. So I'll stick with a little bit of a cliched but, but veritably true Augustine 16th law. Right, so Norm Augustine was the CEO of Lockheed Martin uh, and, and I think Secretary of the Army. And uh, he called this Calvin Coolidge's revenge. And that was in reference to President Coolidge in 1928 uh, saying, why can't we just buy one airplane and let all the aviators take turns flying it after he was presented with a bill for, uh, for a $25,000 uh, purchase for a squadron uh, of aircraft. And Augustine's point is that Coolidge's wish may very well come true if these exponential cost trends continue unchecked through the year 2054. Now, we should all be wary, right, of uh, falling into the Malthusian trap of, of taking an exponential trend and extrapolating it uh, into the distant future. But I will say that Augustine published this in, in 1983, and, uh, and I have very helpfully replotted it and, uh, and added a couple of new fighter aircraft that were built since 1983, uh, including the Joint Strike Fighter, and they have very, very faithfully uh, followed the exponential trend line. And lest you think that this is uh, unique to defense and a consequence of you know, red tape or cost plus contracting or whatever is your favorite, uh, favorite critique of, of the defense acquisition system, uh, Augustine also obliged us with a comparable exponential cost trend for commercial airplanes. And there's actually a pretty straightforward explanation uh, for why the systems engineering process increasingly struggles with, uh, with complexity growth. Uh, as you integrate the individually designed and optimized partitions of the system, in addition to the interfaces that you, that you specified and tracked during the decomposition and the requirements allocation phase, there are inevitably undesired and unanticipated interactions that occur between, the, between these partitions. And these frequently take the form of like mechanical vibrations or thermal leakage or electromagnetic interference. And, and because airplanes, satellites, rockets, and, and, and other, other vehicles uh, they really aren't getting any bigger, but they are getting more complex. So the effect of like complexity density, if that's a metric that you're willing to indulge me on, uh, the complexity density is growing because there's more and more components and they're miniaturized and packed ever more tightly. And so the number of these unanticipated interactions, uh, interactions grows. 
and they do get discovered, right? So you know, you can take your flight, your, your airplane home uh, uh, with with a peaceful mind. They get discovered, but this happens during the verification and and test process, which is very late in the design cycle, and so it's really expensive to go back and redesign the system uh, at that point. And so that's, I think that's one of the cruxes of, of, of cost ex escalation uh, that, we're, that we're seeing in these, in these classes of systems. Now also the verification problem itself doesn't really scale very well with, with system complexity. And this of course is the state space uh, explosion, right? The exponential growth in the number of possible system states or system modes uh, that you have to test. And as we start to develop uh, systems that learn and adapt over the course of their life, right? So think uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, which isn't really something that we, we see a lot of in aerospace, but we are starting to see in cars. Uh, the, the verification problem is going to get really hard if you think it's already hard because of the size of the state space. And uh, so we're starting to see these, but, but also other creeks in, in the systems engineering model. Um, uh, another example is that the fairly primitive way in which the system deals with software is just another physics discipline. And, and this cyber-physical seam between the software and the, and, the, and the physical embodiment on which it runs, it's really coming to haunt us on cybersecurity of, uh, of these physical systems. Um, and we, we seem to have gotten pretty good at building reliability, which is more or less a static attribute uh, that you can, you can analyze and, and design um, uh, from the beginning. But we are coming to realize that security, where there is a, an intelligent and rapidly evolving adversary on the other side, it requires a fundamentally different approach that the, that the systems engineering model isn't well, uh, well suited to. So I guess the question is, what, what can we do, right? And, and I think, by the way, that the joint strike fighter, uh, which is today, the, you know, Sage was the most expensive development program then, uh, it, it, the joint strike fighter is today's most expensive development program in history, and it's so, by, again, by a long shot, right? These things, uh, the orders of magnitude from, from Augustine, you really start to see them. So it's 400 billion in, in development and acquisition costs, which is kind of a, uh, a eye-watering thing. Uh, and and I, think, I think the JSF is gonna be the straw that breaks the camel's back. And, Hopefully no beheading uh, will come as a result of it, but, but a new design epoch, I think, is, is, coming, is coming relatively soon. So what is it gonna look like? Well, let's make it more fun rather than me telling you, um, why don't we just look at all of the different options uh, that we have? Uh, and so, so here are some options for reducing the cost of complexity in cyber physical systems. Um, now, very heavily inspired, uh, this list is uh, by the cyber side. Uh, of course, um, and if I'm missing any important ones, I'd, I'd love to hear from you. Um, so there are two, two categories of things here. First, uh, on, on the left side, is we can make the product itself uh, less complex. Um, and there are basically two ways of doing that. One is just make it simpler, right? Uh, and sometimes technology breakthroughs or sheer sort of engineering ingenuity uh, can help find a way to meet a given requirement uh, more simply. Than, than you do it. And so an example might be like an electric drone replacing a manned helicopter, right, uh, for, for a reconnaissance mission. Um, but th this is pretty rare, and it's also very difficult to anticipate. Uh, so probably not a systemic solution uh, for engineering design, but, but a pleasant, uh, pleasant surprise when, when it does happen. Um, alternatively, almost any engineering, uh, engineering design contains some superfluous uh, complexity in it, beyond sort of the absolute minimum level of, of complexity that you need to meet the requirement. And so I guess I'm describing something like a physical analog to, to the Kolmogorov complexity that you would think about for an algorithm. Uh, and so anything beyond that uh, is superfluous, right, sort of by definition. And so I know of no systematic study of this for a uh, study of unnecessary complexity in, uh, in physical systems. So again, if, if any of you have done one, I'd, I'd be very interested to see it. Um, and, and to be honest, I'm skeptical that it would yield uh, particularly significant gains, uh, but maybe that's me extolling, extolling the virtues of the, of the human designer here too much. Um, there have been a, a, few, a few examples of successful applications of design automation, which is also on the right side of this chart, uh, to create designs uh, that are superior to those that a, that a human engineer can make. So there's no reason in principle that, that you couldn't take a similar approach and, and try to identify uh, superfluous complexity in, in, a, in a design. So I think it'd be a, a fascinating topic to explore further. Um, another approach to reducing complexity that's still on the left is modularity. Um, and modularity partitions a system into 
less complex pieces and severs most of the interactions between them so that you can pretty much design and verify the, the pieces uh, independently. And personally, I'm a huge fan, fan of modularity. Uh, I championed modular satellites at DARPA, uh, a modular smartphone uh, when I was at Motorola and at Google, and a modular aircraft cabin, believe it or not, uh, at Airbus. And the main downside of modularity is that it introduces overhead into the design. Uh, and this explains why it's so much more popular in software, where the cost of the overhead is, is pretty low uh, than, it is, than it is in physical systems. Um, but with, with miniaturization and careful partitioning, uh, modularity can buy its way into many, many more system designs uh, than it does today. In addition to reducing complexity, it can also improve the upgradability uh, of a system, the maintainability, or other, other aspects of flexibility of the design. But unfortunately, all too often, these illities, um, which can be very difficult to quantify, they don't make it into the design requirements. Uh, and the requirements focus instead on performance and cost, which actually incentivizes the opposite of modularity. It, it, it creates a tightly integrated uh, point design to meet those specific, uh, those specific point requirements. And, and so modular design probably doesn't require like a whole new design methodology, um, although I think it can benefit from, from many of the things that we'll talk about on the right here. Um, it really only requires a different approach to requirements so that the value of modularity uh, is properly reflected uh, uh, and incentivized in the engineering design trades. So I do think there is some fruitful work to be done on, on reducing product complexity, but I don't, think, I don't think either of these approaches is going to be the panacea uh, that we're looking for, at least not for aerospace systems uh, that will continue, I, I imagine, uh, to, to operate on the bleeding edge of, of sort of what the laws of physics, uh, physics allow. So the complexity of these kinds of systems is going to grow. And the second category of things we can do uh, is change the design system to better manage, manage complexity. And uh, the first and, and I think most potent tool in this arsenal is abstraction, as we talked about uh, in, in, in software. And it has supported incredible complexity growth in, in the cyber domain, as, as all of you know. Uh, the software of a modern airplane or weapon system is about three, four, maybe five orders of magnitude more complex than the software of, um, of the SAGE air defense system. That's whether you count lines of code or function points or whatever your favorite, favorite measure is. Um, but, but the application of abstraction, of course, hasn't been limited, uh, limited to software. The design of integrated circuits has sustained uh, eight orders of magnitude increase in complexity from the first uh, general purpose uh, transistor-based processor to a modern day multi-core type processor. And that's been largely through the introduction of, uh, of several layers of abstraction uh, in the design process. And yet, abstraction has found no application, zero, in the mechanical design of systems. So today, a design engineer sees and touches every single component of an airplane, just as they did a century ago. And I think that's, that's incredible. So next on the list is design automation. And, and that also, by the way, has found widespread application in electronics, uh, for sure in integrated circuits, but also in the automated layout of like printed, printed circuit boards, uh, for instance. There's been a bit of work, as I mentioned, on design automation uh, for other systems, in, in particular for structural elements uh, and for the creation of, of new materials. Um, but I wouldn't say that any of these techniques have, have made it into widespread use. Um, and there is a lot of potential here, um, particularly with the introduction of AI techniques like adversarial machine learning, um, which, which could allow us to really explore parts of the design space which, which we can't efficiently or can't even fathom sometimes uh, in, in, in the mind of the engineer. Um, automation of verification, uh, the, the third item there on the list, is a little bit more common now, uh, with automated test procedures becoming kind of a standard, uh, a standard thing on, on some classes of aerospace systems, again, mostly electronics, avionics, those sorts of things. Um, it's unclear if test automation uh, is going to keep up with the growth and size of the state space that actually needs to be, needs to be tested and verified. Um, but other approaches that are, that are more scalable, maybe, like proof-based methods, really haven't found their way to, uh, to physical systems. And, and that's mainly because of lack of suitable models uh, for, those kinds of, uh, for those kinds of approaches. Automated design closure, uh, which is closely related to, to, to automation and verification, is just kind of a more ambitious version of it. Uh, so rather than just improving the productivity of, of verification, here we're talking about actually doing the full design closure quickly and on demand 
at any time during, during the design process. And this would be revolutionary for, for a physical system. Uh, but, but as I mentioned before, this is today kind of a very manual, very laborious process that happens, uh, that happens at the big design reviews. Uh, and, and each time it yields a flurry of engineering changes. And so doing it more frequently would smooth out the profile of, of engineering changes that have to happen and pull many of them much earlier uh, into, into the development process when they're a lot cheaper uh, to actually implement. And the last item on this list is, is design reuse. Um, and of course, you know, any smart, uh, any smart design engineer would, would use a prior design as a point of departure for a new one, right? That's, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm talking about black box uh, reuse. Uh, and this today you would only see in a highly modular design. And that's because of the difficulty of, of describing and guaranteeing the behavior of your black box design at the interfaces, except in, in, in these very sim sim simple modular cases. If you could reuse any piece of any design, that would be, that would be a significant, significant breakthrough. So I mentioned that all of these approaches are, are borrowed from, from software, but you also heard me mention a few times now uh, the, uh, the fact that they have found application in integrated circuits. So, so I do want to spend a few minutes examining uh, how chip design uh, and see what lessons we might be able to extract for, for mechanical systems and ultimately for, for these rich heterogeneous cyber physical systems from that. So the first integrated circuits were, were designed by hand and laid out manually. Uh, and this quickly became impractical to do uh, uh, for at, at sort of at the individual transistor level. And so even the early layout, uh, they started doing it in blocks of transistors that, that composed, uh, composed Boolean logic gates. And, uh, but as the transistor count grew more rapidly, exponentially, you know, Moore's law and all, uh, so did the cost and time, as, as one would expect, um, of developing new chips. And so here it was the, the Intel 286, which was the straw that, that broke the camel's back. Um, and by the time Intel was gearing up to do the 386 in, in the mid-1980s, they, uh, they really adopted full, full, uh, full bore the new design methodology that had just come out, which was VLSI, very large-scale integration, uh, Carver Mead, Lynn Conway. And VLSI really systematized the design process and added yet another layer of abstraction over, over the logic gate level, uh, and that was called RTL, re register transfer level. And VLSI design also required a new, new generation of design tools, and these came to be known as electronic design automation, or, or EDA tools. And uh, true to its name, EDA uh, allowed designers to interact with the design at a very, very high level of abstraction, while automating the design synthesis at, at the lower levels. And the tools also verified that the resulting design that came out of this design synthesis exercise, automated design synthesis exercise, would actually meet the design requirements, both in terms of the digital logic, but also in terms of like the analog byproducts of, of the digital logic. So this is like heat or electromagnetic, uh, electromagnetic effects. And the key underpinning of VLSI and EDA is a model library that fully describes the behavior of the low level components from which you can compose the design uh, and a set of design rules for how you're allowed uh, to do this, this composition of, of uh, component composition. And uh, so I kind of enjoy this. It's a visually, I think, a rather visually stark uh, illustrative comparison of uh, pre-VLSI chip design on the left, and that's the Intel 4004, which was 1971, um, and that's a manual process, and you can, you can tell, right? And then on the right is a modern multi-core processor designed using a VLSI uh, and EDA uh, design flow. And so I think that's a fun juxtaposition. Um, and while you're looking at that, look at this one. Um, so that's modern jet engine, right? And you can tell uh, that's very much a byproduct of human ingenuity and not, uh, not any sort of design automation. Um, so I, I should also mention that there have been some, some thoughtful uh, and, and potent critiques of the idea that, uh, that physical, meaning mechanical systems, can ever really resemble VLSI, uh, VLSI design. Uh, and uh, probably most notable here is MIT's Dan, Dan Whitney, who had a paper 20 years ago uh, called Why Mechanical Design Will Never Be Like VLSI Design. And, and although I disagree with his categorical conclusion, as, as you might imagine, um, he does have a couple of key points um, that, that, that I'll discuss briefly. So first, the, the behavior of mechanical components in a jet engine, uh, since we're using a jet engine example, is much richer and much more nonlinear than a transistor in, in an integrated circuit. So for the transistor, you have to basically account for its electrical and thermal properties, right? That's, those are the main ones. Um, for a mechanical component, you have the additional considerations, right? Uh, motion, 
deformation, degradation over, over its service life. And these must indeed be modeled, uh, and, and the modeling challenge is, is really a big one. Um, but I don't think that anything about it and the, the intervening sort of 20 years since Whitney's critique um, have shown that it's an insurmountable challenge. So models for all of those things that I just mentioned as examples uh, do, do exist today. The second point is that, uh, that Whitney makes is that because the power levels and the degree of integration are so much greater, the components in a mechanical system cannot be modeled in isolation in the way that they sometimes can be in, uh, in, a, in a chip design. So each component must incorporate the effects, or each component model must incorporate the effects of other uh, relevant components. And that is very true. So I, I also fully, fully agree with that. Um, and in fact, I would add to that that uh, the component models also have to reflect the, the effects of the external environment. Um, because a microchip uh, only interacts very weakly with the environment around it, um, while an engine um, experiences not just airflow, but also like the wing that it's attached to and weather, like ingesting rain and hail and things, um, and an occasional bird maybe, right? And so all of these things have to be modeled. And, uh, and so each component has its own model, um, as well as a set of context models that are either from adjacent components or from the external environment or, or the combination of the two. And, and so that is a difference and it is a complication for sure. Um, but again, I, I don't think, uh, and some of the, some of the experience uh, I can share with you doesn't suggest that that is an insurmountable, insurmountable challenge. Um, uh, because it's really predicated on the primacy of, of behavioral modeling, I like to sort of call this VLSI-inspired uh, design methodology uh, as it's applied to, to large-scale um, uh, cyber-physical systems. I, I call it the model-based digital design thread, which was sort of the title of the talk. Um, and it's important, so the model I, I explained, uh, the reason it's a thread is because there's a lot of model-based design efforts that are that are point that take a specific point in the life cycle of a product and apply sort of model-based uh, design techniques to that, and that's cool. But but what I'm describing here is actually an end-to-end -end process uh, that should extend not just for the entirety of the design cycle, but actually through manufacture and through the operation phase uh, of the product as well. Um, now you might also kind of uh, tongue-in-cheek consider calling it Newton's revenge instead of Coolidge's revenge, um, since it would finally deliver on this 17th century dream, right, of having a full physics-based predictive model of the product before, before you ever actually build it. So I've tried three times, uh, and, and David mentioned a little bit of that uh, in the introduction, three times over the course of my career to develop this kind of end-to-end -end design system. Uh, so when I was at DARPA starting 10 years ago, the META program, which was part of, the, uh, of this overarching adaptive vehicle make initiative, aimed to do this for, uh, for an army ground vehicle. Uh, at Airbus, we launched the Digital Design Manufacturing and Services, or DDMS initiative, and that continues, and, and it strives to do that and prepare Airbus for the next clean sheet uh, commercial airplane design. And at UTC, uh, we started the model-based digital thread, uh, which is a end-to-end -end, uh, design and manufacturing demonstrator um, for a small jet engine. And, and I think Alberto Ferrari, uh, my colleague from UTC, was uh, at, 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 this very, at this very meeting and, uh, and talked about, uh, about UTC's model-based digital thread. So, so let me sort of extract and, uh, and abstract, at the risk of overusing the term, um, some learnings uh, from these efforts. And, and so, in particular, I want to hit three technical challenges and three uh, socio-technical challenges uh, to implementing such a design system. So first, building a library of component models and context models is the single biggest obstacle to a truly end-to-end -end model based design system. Uh, it is expensive, it is time consuming, it's never been done for anything at remotely resembling the scale of, of an airplane. Um, in VLSI design, the cost of the model library is amortized over a very, very large number of chip designs, typically. Uh, new airplane programs happen very infrequently, and the airplane makers typically treat each program as, as a standalone business case. Now, some automotive companies have taken, uh, taken a consortium approach to, to model development, and AutoSAR is, is an example of that. And, and aerospace does actually have, uh, also on the plus side, one big advantage. Uh, because of the sophistication of the product, a lot of the models already exist. They are scattered around the enterprise and they're scattered throughout the supply base. Um, and for sure, model sharing and intellectual property of these models 
is going to emerge, emerge as a huge issue uh, in the coming years as, as we move in this direction. And, and also, one comment about model creation. Um, uh, most of the successful modeling efforts I've seen are physics-based models that are validated with experimental data. Uh, and if I had a nickel for every time somebody asked me, aren't we already over-reliant on simulation and shouldn't we build more test rigs, I would be very rich. Um, so uh, to me, it is not an either-or proposition. Uh, you need both simulation and you need testing. But the, the key point that, I, uh, that, that I'd like to impart is that instead of taking the test rig data and feeding it into a spreadsheet and then plugging it into a PowerPoint and showing the PowerPoint at a design review, you've got to use that data to tune the physics-based simulation model, right? And we don't do a lot of that. Now, the, the second technical challenge uh, there on that list is how do you integrate these uh, you know, thermal, electrical, mechanical, and other models so that you can operate across them and reason about the properties of the entire system and not just the individual domain that you're modeling. And this one I think we convincingly demonstrated on the DARPA meta program uh, that it can be solved and it can be solved at scale. And, uh, and the approach here is based on, on two decades of work by Janusz uh, Stepanovich and, and many of his colleagues and students, including, by the way, Ethan Jackson. I don't know if he's here already, but he will be the morning keynote, keynote tomorrow. And the, the key insight here is, is semantic integration of existing uh, domain-specific modeling languages and not requiring designers and modelers to change from the thousands, and there are literally thousands of design tools that go into, that get utilized in the design of an, of an airplane, uh, and not switch from those thousands of tools to some, some new modeling language, but actually take those existing tools and integrate the semantics so that you can reason across, uh, across the entire design. And the final technical challenge there I want to mention is, is model continuity. And uh, so the high fidelity models that, that you want uh, to use for, for design verification are not the models that you want to use uh, for, for, for instance, conceptual uh, design space exploration. Uh, another way to look at it is that you want to smoothly reduce the uncertainty uh, throughout the design process uh, until you have your final design artifact that is uh, correct by design. Uh, and pretty much assured to meet the requirements if, if you build it as, as you designed it. And here the approach is typically to start with the, the high fidelity model and apply some combination of model order reduction or linearization or surrogate modeling in order to create the lower fidelity models. Um, and, and this is hard, right? Uh, and I, I think many of you know firsthand that this is actually quite hard to do. Um, but you do want to have that model continuity from, from beginning to end. Um, and so here, I, actually, modern machine learning methods seem to be a particularly uh, promising, promising approach for surrogate modeling. Um, but, there, uh, but there are definitely some juicy problems uh, remain, uh, remaining to be solved in, 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 in assuring model continuity throughout, throughout the design process. And so finally, um, I'd like to say just a couple words about the socio-technical challenges. Um, and, um, and first, on the industry, uh, on the industry value chain, um, I mentioned the question of who develops and owns the models, and, and I think that's definitely up for grabs. Um, and it could reshape and very significantly reshape uh, the relationships between the system integrators, uh, the supply base, and the tool vendors um, in, uh, in, in, the, in the ecosystem. But even more interesting, maybe, is the relationship between design, uh, design and manufacturing and designer and manufacturer. Uh, so as you'll recall, in the craft uh, epoch of design, there was no separation between design and construction. Then with dimension drawings, uh, you, you separated the two, and that's so that you could pay the builders less, basically. Um, and in the systems engineering era, the pendulum swung back a little bit. Um, and so although design and manufacturing are, are, are very much two, two distinct professions today, um, they do usually live under one roof, or at least, uh, or at least in the same company. Um, and although we, we frequently complain and, and, and lament uh, about the seam between design and manufacture, and when an engineer designs something that's really, really hard to manufacture, um, uh, but, but there's actually quite a bit of interaction that happens in, in a company like Airbus, for instance, um, uh, between the two sides of the house. Um, and, and handing over a modern airplane design from at the, at the, at the conclusion, unfortunately, of the engineering phase um, because it is quite sequential to manufacturing is a very, very, very engaged process. Um, and it's only in the lower tiers of the supply chain that you see things like pure, pure built-to-print uh, manufacturing companies. Um, it's not, it is not so at all in the VLSI world, right? Um, where, with only a couple of exceptions, 
um, there is a very clear separation between fabulous design on one side and design agnostic uh, manufacturing foundries uh, on the other side. And this isn't entirely, entirely without precedent. Uh, automotive also has a few uh, vehicle level contract manufacturers that, that exist. And uh, Will Roper, who is the current Air Force Acquisition Chief, uh, has said that uh, separation between design and scale production is actually something that the Air Force uh, uh, is seriously considering and wants for its next generation air dominance platform. Um, so I think that's an additional nudge uh, in this direction. Uh, the, the last two items on the list here are around the structure of engineering organizations and, and then how we train the engineers, and the two, the two are very closely related. The key feature of the systems engineering approach, as we discussed, is the ability to partition complex systems. Uh, and in theory, this, this partitioning can occur in, in any number of ways, but in practice, it almost always happens along engineering discipline lines. Uh, so this is the aerodynamic structures, power controls, et cetera. Um, and the design team is, is organized accordingly to how you partition the design. And then most engineers are trained in the way that the design team is organized, because that's how we recruit. Um, and, and so engineers are, are trained and rewarded to become deep subject matter experts in their particular discipline. And we do have, we do have this thing called systems engineers, right? Um, but they are typically trained to manage the design flow. Uh, they are not designers themselves, right? At least not in the current, uh, in the current state of things. And so here I foresee the need for, for very significant change. Uh, and it's change that's not going to come easily, nor is it going to come quickly. Uh, certainly the, the disciplines corresponding to the physics, uh, physics domains, they're here to stay, but they're going to employ modelers, not designers, whose principal job is going to be to build those domain-specific uh, physics-based models that we talked about. And designers are likely to be generalists, uh, because they're not going to have to have, nor will probably they be able to have, deep, uh, deep domain expertise in any one discipline. Um, and in VLSI design, sort of the way this, uh, this played out is that you have front-end designers who are focused on the functional architecture, uh, and then back-end designers who are responsible for the physical realization uh, of that functional architecture, so things like component placement and routing, et cetera. And today, uh, again, outside of the, of, the, of the chip world, we have very few, very few engineers who think this way, and the engineering curriculum is not at all designed this way. And so I highlight this for you, uh, for you because I know many of you are not just researchers, but also, also educators. And, and whereas I see line of sight to the realization of this model-based uh, uh, digital design thread vision, uh, and you know, probably it could be realized at truly industrial scale in, in, the, in the next, say, five years. Um, but the, this socio-technical issue, and particularly the education issue, uh, has a generational lag time to it, right? Um, and so I think it requires uh, really increased emphasis and, and, and some urgent attention. So with that, I'm going to close. Um, I don't know whether we have time for questions. I suspect uh, my, I, I don't have a watch, but my biological clock tells me I've gone for a very long time. Um, uh, and also, I'm very happy to, to engage with people, um, uh, with people at the break or, or online. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, Paul. I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, yeah, very nice talk. Um, from, in your opinion and from the perspective of the tenants you put forward in your talk, uh, what do you think went, went wrong at Boeing in terms of the 787 MAX? <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I think the... Um, uh, so, so I know much better Boeing's competitor on the other, on the other side of the Atlantic, of course. Um, and, and I think that both companies and, and the industry in general has, has had this vision uh, and knew that this was coming for, for, for many years. And David and I worked on it together 10 years ago. And, and I think Boeing, Boeing was all in then and is all in now. Um, I think what happens in the context of a particular program uh, is, is a consequence of many different factors. Um, I think the design flow is maybe part of that. Um, to the best of my knowledge, and there are probably people who know better, because again, I'm, I'm observing this, uh, uh, or was observing this from the other side of the, of the pond. Um, the, the, a lot of the 787 issues were much more around the allocation of responsibility between the system integrator, the prime contractor, and the supply chain, um, and the mechanisms that may or may not have been in place in order to facilitate uh, that change in, in, the, in the allocation of responsibility. 
Um, so, so I'm not sure that I would, I would chalk it up to, uh, to, a, to a new design flow or, or a new generation of tools, but I'm also not, not sort of the best person to comment on, on what, what happened at Boeing 20 years ago. Um, other, other questions? really interesting and I wonder if you could say more about uh, what kinds of new techniques need to be developed to address those new security or kind of certifiability concerns. Yeah, well, I think, I, I guess I made two different points which may be, may be related or may not be related, I'm not sure. Um, uh, so, so one point was around the fact that it's as you incorporate machine learning and systems that learn over the course of their operating life, um, verification of those systems, right, security to one side, uh, but even just verification, safety, the safety case for those systems becomes in incredibly hard to make, right? Because you, can pr you may be able to prove the safety case at design time or at, at time of release, but then if the system uh, evolves o over, the course, uh, over the course of its operating life, that safety case may no longer be valid. Um, and, then, and then, of course, sort of a, a, pre a prequel, I suppose, to that is the fact that maybe even proving the safety case at design time if you, if you don't know what went into training that system is maybe difficult, right? But that strikes me as, a, as actually a pretty solvable, a pretty solvable problem. Um, I made a separate point about the fact that um, existing cyber physical systems that are built using the traditional way, right? So even before we get to artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, uh, don't do a very good job of uh, being robust to, 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 to cyber threats. Um, because again, the system is designed against some reference environment at design time. It's tested, it's verified against uh, that reference environment. You know, increasingly systems will have some threat vectors that will be part of the, of the, of the requirements and, and, the, and, the, and the reference environment, but those threat, those threat actors and those threat vectors evolve and they tend to evolve quite quickly and be quite well financed as it turns out. Um, and so the system faces something that's completely different over over the course of its operating life. Now, I think your question was like, let's combine those two, and now you have a system that learns and evolves, and you have evolving threat vectors, and that kind of makes my head explode, right? So that's a it's a doubly complicated, uh, doubly complicated thing. Um, I do think we have a speaker from from Uber, if I'm not mistaken, uh, later later in the day, and I think it would be fascinating to ask that question uh, <laughs> uh, of, the, of that speaker. You're welcome. <laughs> So verification of AI or machine learning is also a challenge. Uh, so if you have an AI system, how do you verify that it actually behaves the way that it has been designed? So do you have any thoughts about that? I think Uber is an example, or Tesla is an example of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, look, this is obviously a very in vogue question, right? Um, uh, and, and in fact, uh, Janish, I don't know where you are, but we had, we had a long dinner conversation about it last night. Um, and, and, and I actually tend to agree with, uh, with Janish's perspective, but I'll claim it as my own here for, for, for not uh, putting words in his mouth, um, which is the fact that, look, all, all, of, these, all of these machine learning systems, um, uh, they're just pattern matching, right? It's just glorified pattern matching, just at, at a very large scale and, in, and in, a systematic, uh, in a systematic manner. So you should be able if you know what you trained the system on and what were the bounds of the training data set, um, you should be able to circumscribe the behavior of that system and be able to prove, the, prove properties or, or, or test properties of that system as, as, you, do, as you do any other. It, the scale is bigger, right? So, so the state space explosion problem is, is a bigger problem, um, but I don't think that it's sort of different in kind, right? So I don't think the systems are gonna suddenly develop sentience and behave in some other way because you know, they have ulterior motives. Um, I think it is I mean, just a matter of scale and in verifying a large, a large pattern matching system. Now, if they learn over the course of their operating life, right, that's a different issue because you don't know what, what they're learning at that point. And so you would either have to re-verify them or not allow them to learn after a certain point uh, of, of, of verification. That's it? I, I think that's it. All right, very good. Well, thank you again. Appreciate the invitation.